this question, which is how far are we from understanding eco-hydrological processes that determine vegetation patterns? And uh, uh, we, Paolo Dodorico and Jost, we discussed a little bit yesterday how to introduce this, and we came up with a few uh, bullet points that we would like to share with you, and then open the floor for discussion. And really, this is just us starting the, the, the talk. We, we heard this pattern a recurrent uh, word uh, many times. So I think we can, we can uh, think of patterns in two ways. There are patterns in ecohydrology that are uh, intrinsic to the soil plant uh, biogeochemical system, and I'll, uh, meaning really coming out of, the, of some interaction, it seems, between the soil and the plant and the carbon and nitrogen cycle, and some, and some that are more extrinsic to, to the dynamics, meaning that are uh, imposed by probably some uh, sort of organization that the basin itself has, independent of vegetation, which also Ignacio uh, hinted at yesterday. So these are the extrinsic forcing to patterns at the, at the basin scale, and of course these are the other ones that we saw yesterday in uh, a different scale, the bands, the, the labyrinth. And I also put a few figures on top referring to other more not necessarily semi-arid type of systems where you have a strong interaction between the, um, the stream, the sediments, and, and the vegetation. So this, this would be more examples of, of intrinsic patterns. Now, uh, if, if, if we had uh, sampled and, and done a research of how many times patterns have been mentioned uh, yesterday, is uh, uh, there are several uh, patterns came up several times, and why are they so popular in um, uh, such a popular subject? Where we, we one of the ideas is, if we think about it, it's probably, and this is like more provocatory, uh, it's probably we could call it the Shannon von Neumann effect. Uh, it's like uh, the entropy, you know. There is this famous phrase of uh, von Neumann to to Shannon that says, yes call it entropy and use it because nobody really knows what entropy is and that will give you an advantage when you have a debate or a presentation and we could just take pattern instead of uh, entropy and pro perhaps do the same trick. Uh, on a more positive spin, of course, uh, the, the patterns give us w one reason why we really uh, are fascinated by patterns in ecohydrology, we believe, is because they give us hope to think of uh, having reached, having understood some, some processes, some fundamental equations that, are underli that underlie them. And uh, something like what happens in fluid mechanics, this is a beautiful example uh, taken from, uh, from uh, atmospheric dynamics. You have an island, you have a stream that uh, um, uh, invests it and forms a von Karman strip. These are other examples in, in atmospheric science where you have the uh, kelvin helmholtz instability. So uh, this is just another example, just to show some beautiful pictures of uh, dunes and, and ripples. So very much like in fluids uh, and, and chemical system, uh, patterns give us, uh, represent emergent properties of the system that basically exist only when you see the system as a whole, macroscopically. Uh, when you have several plants that interact with the cycling of, of nutrients and, uh, and water, and their boundary conditions, and they don't exist at, at the molecular, at the, meaning at the plant level or at the single uh, element level. So they're truly ecological phenomena. That's probably why we're so fascinated by them. And uh, then, of course, there is the question that we just and Paolo discussed. Uh, well, we need to define probably then more uh, uh, rigorously, provide a classification of this, which uh, uh, something that has not been done completely, discussing what is truly deterministic versus uh, irregular, the role of distributions of <coughs> geometrical properties of them, including the famous power laws that were discussed yesterday, the role of noise, and uh, their thermodynamic interpretation. There is lots of, uh, uh, of research and, and that still needs to be done in this, in this uh, direction. We, heard yesterday mentioning Brigogine and the uh, 
uh, organization of dissipative structures in, in thermodynamic systems out of equilibrium, well, probably patterns are uh, like in, in chemical systems, this type of uh, manifestation. And so then we come to the good and bad of patterns. Why are they good? Why are they bad for us? And uh, well, one good point is that they really fo provide us with a focus point to dig deeper into the processes. We have this role of, uh, this goal of uh, explaining what a pattern is. And uh, on, the, on the bad side, we have seen it yesterday, it's, uh, it's almost like universal. No matter what type of uh, reaction diffusion equation with some sort of uh, special coupling, you get a pattern. And uh, this is exciting, but at the same time, it's a bit, uh, uh, it's almost like equi equifinality problem. What, what, what exactly they represent. And there are several mechanisms that uh, produce pattern. We know that Turing instability, spin or decomposition, uh, there are noise induced patterns and, not, and perhaps putting some order in, into all of this would, would be very useful in eco hydrology. So we come to, to the end and then uh, perhaps I will leave these slides for, to start the discussion. What are the missing pieces then? What, what is still needs to be done? Have we learned everything? Clearly not. Um, for example, uh, just a provocatory question. Maybe, uh, what have we learned in the last 10 years? Was it everything already understood at the beginning when the first few models were, were proposed? Is the, is, what, what was the impact of, of that research? What are we expecting? What breakthroughs? Uh, uh, what, I, I mentioned that already. Uh, what is exactly the link with the thermodynamic? What are the thermodynamic principles that determine this instability of the homogeneous that produces the pattern? This is an old concept in, uh, in thermodynamics. And what are we neglecting? Clearly, uh, we are neglecting multi the role of multi-species, the role of biodiversity. We know that biodiversity stabilizes many of the ecosystem properties, but I don't think we are at the point where we know how biodiversity affects patterns. And uh, that's about it for to start the discussion. I think Paolo and York will help me stir you and, and start the discussion. Uh, okay. Uh, so I think uh, we could, uh, of course, we cannot discuss all these points together, but. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Uh, one of the most important ones is, is where Milker started, which is uh, we have seen yesterday already many examples of uh, different mechanisms and, uh, by which uh, you can develop uh, these vegetation patterns. And uh, the problem is really, uh, in the end, the real problem is for us is, is uh, universality of these patterns. Uh, they emerge from these systems. Uh, we, we know the mathematical theory of that. Uh, the end, you, could, you have a universal sequence of patterns which we all recognize. You have your spots, your bands, uh, your holes, even. We haven't seen many of those. Um, and, and, and you can actually f uh, reconduce these usually to, to some uh, to simple instabilities of some canonical equations. And actually, uh, I believe you can do this exercise for most of the examples we have already seen uh, yesterday. So the, the problem is this is a big advantage because of course we can uh, build up models which reproduce what we observe. Um, and usually these models are also quite robust. Um, in my personal experience, I've seen that uh, as long as you choose reasonable places in the parameter space, um, you do your best effort, of course, to, to find the correct parameters, um, you, you don't have to struggle too much to, to, to reproduce what you actually observe. Um, this is a big advantage. I see it also as a big disadvantage, as uh, Milker already mentioned. Because, of course, at that point, we cannot really distinguish and cannot, cannot really tell w if um, the mechanism which we put in our um, models um, are the correct ones or are the best possible reproduction of, uh, of this mechanism. Um, the, the other point is that, in, in a sense, we, we we rarely see predictions made from this point Antonello made yesterday to me. Uh, you rarely see predictions made uh, with these, um, with these uh, models. Uh, 
So what often happens is you, you have observations and you find a model to fit observations. And I believe that is a, a point we should think about. And in a sense, there has been no serious effort to actually start to compare observations with, um, and this is probably more a topic for, um, for, for the round table on, I believe, tomorrow, to compare the observations with, uh, with, uh, with the models. But it's actually the main point also here. Um, if we have to answer the question, how far are we from understanding? I believe we have all the time to go back uh, what Moshe, to, what, uh, to something like what Moshe presented in his, uh, in his presentation. So we have to go back to the system to see the complexity of the system and uh, start comparing, uh, start actually screening the different mechanisms which could be at work and see if uh, our model representation is actually uh, the most appropriate one. Yeah, I, um, I definitely agree with this point. I remember years ago we had a similar uh, meeting in Balsevaranche and uh, Ehud made this point that uh, because the patterns are so universal, they don't tell us much. I think uh, I remember that and that re remains with me in these years because I think uh, uh, it's uh, sort of disappointing because we, look at, we study patterns for two reasons. The first uh, and most important reason is because they are beautiful. And the second reason is because we want to infer processes from patterns, but that uh, uh, becomes very difficult uh, if uh, uh, we get uh, many pa the same patterns with different uh, type of mechanisms. So this goes back to the uh, more important problem that, uh, as you were saying, we need to start from the processes and then uh, and from our understanding of the uh, underlying processes uh, uh, and then from there see if we can uh, obtain the patterns. That's for sure a better uh, approach. And even in that way, we could get the right answers, uh, the, ro the right answers uh, for the wrong reasons. Um, the, uh, another thing I wanted to say is that uh, in uh, uh, a very similar field, the field of geomorphology is all based on this, uh, the idea of uh, relating shapes to processes, of, uh, patterns to processes. But the big difference there is that uh, uh, I, I see two differences. One is that it's easier to have equations to start from. It's easier to have process-based equations uh, on uh, sediment transport or uh, mainly, yeah, and that we can use to, uh, to see if we can regenerate uh, a certain, uh, we can reproduce a certain pattern. In the case uh, of uh, patterns in ecology, the approach is really a little bit different. With the equations, we have, um, many of us have started from uh, known models or that uh, lead to pattern formation, and mainly the two models has been the Turing, instability, so patterns induced by diffusion, or the other, and I never remember the name, when it's induced by uh, drift, and, uh, uh, and then force the, uh, and build around uh, these models an ecological story to make the, 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 uh, these models work for our application, which is completely different from what, uh, in, for example, in geomorphology has been done. And, um, and uh, sometimes this approach can work, but in other in times uh, it's uh, just a sta um, starting point, and uh, we should probably uh, see what's... Uh, uh, the next, uh, what the next step uh, uh, could be. I don't know if uh, the people in the room uh, uh, agree with this, uh, with these points. Perhaps we can. No, I, think. Um, I don't know very much about the patterns, but um, um, when you think about uh, what is the function of patterns on a tiger versus the patterns in a tiger bush uh, vegetation, they obviously have different origins and different meanings. Uh, and uh, and I, I guess the the um, the focus on the pattern itself is probably misleading. Uh, what I think is uh, what I think is uh, probably more important, and I'm not sure, is uh, what are the uh, the uh, translation of these patterns first on the self-organization of the system. In other words, why the system selects to organize itself in that particular pattern, which is uh, the uh, you know, the forward problem, and then of course, what are the significance of these patterns on fluxes or resource use in the system? If they are neutral to a random uh, arrangement, then uh, they would not have been there, and if they are not, what are the significance, you know, what is the, uh, the, um, the uh, impact on, you know, any flux of, of your choice? So I think this will kind of uh, uh, 
provide maybe a way to distinguish between uh, the shape, you know, as I said, the tiger, uh, you know, and the tiger's fur uh, pattern versus vegetation to, se to separate there from the shape to the functionality and then the step of organization, you know, how they are organized and what they do on the fluxes. Just to uh, follow up on this idea, uh, so Danny is speaking about uh, the functionality and how the pattern like evolve to uh, meet some uh, uh, function or some optimization, but maybe the, the pattern are uh, not uh, something that the system is uh, uh, um, tending toward, but it's what the system can uh, allow or what, it's a, a something that is uh, the, the expression of limits, uh, limits of resources or uh, limits imposed by uh, initial conditions. For example, all these equations that uh, we are applying, we don't consider uh, uh, spatial variability, for example, of soil properties, spatial variability of depth, spatial variability of uh, rock, rock outcrops. So there is a lot of initial conditions that already put strong constraint on the possibility of the system to uh, go to one direction uh, rather than the other, and maybe the, the pattern are the expression of uh, limits imposed on the specific natural system, and when you can release some of these limits, then you can uh, allow the, 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 the natural system to go further to another uh, uh, step or another stage of uh, equilibrium with the new the new limits. It's like uh, moving from um, uh, a limited uh, system to another one, and and the pattern as expressing these these limits. Well, first I would like to to say that. Uh, we know we have a, a great deal of knowledge about vegetation patterns, uh, which are based on models. I mean, uh, uh, this knowledge has still to be uh, confronted with, with experiments. That unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, we do not have yet controlled experiments, although I believe they are doable. But um, we, do, we do know uh, quite a lot. We know that uh, along the rainfall gradient, we have five basic uh, vegetation states bare soil, spot patterns, stripes, gaps, and uniform vegetation. We know that there are bistability ranges for any pair of such states, and within these bistability ranges, there are many more, a multitude of additional stable patterns, which are special mixtures of the two. In the case of uh, bistability of uniform and uh, pattern states, there is a well-developed mathematical theory uh, for those mixed patterns. Uh, this is a, a very active topic today in uh, mathematics, and it's uh, called uh, this, this phenomenon a uh, homoclinic snaking. It uh, basically describes patterns that are domains of periodic patterns in an otherwise uniform state, either bare soil or the uniform vegetation. And those domains can be of various sizes, and you can have many different domains of different sizes within the the same system, and they all form stable patterns. So you have, uh, we usually talk about uh, bistability of two states, the uh, spot pattern and the bare soil, or the, the gap, gap pattern and the period and uh, uniform vegetation. But in fact, we have many, many more uh, intermediate or hybrid states. And actually, this also changes, uh, should change the uh, concept of regime shifts, because regime shifts are not necessarily between uh, the, the two alternative stable states because there are all those intermediate states in between and those regime shifts can, can uh, probe uh, uh, this, uh, uh, these intermediate states. Now, um, uh, we talked here about regular versus uh, irregular patterns. So obviously those uh, mixed patterns, intermediate states, are irregular. Now you can have spot here, group of spots there, uh, these are not periodic patterns, but they still have the landscape. <coughs> they have the width of the spot, or if it's stripe pattern, you have the, width, the, uh, the uh, diameter of the spot. Stripe pattern, you have the width of the stripe. Gap pattern, you have the diameter of the gap. Now, there are conditions, and we also uh, have uh, some under understanding that under, uh, under certain conditions, we get 
amorphous type of patterns with wide patch size distributions, with the patches that uh, are not round or not stripes, uh, and span a wide uh, range of patches. And this has uh, to do with the global competition, which may develop under certain, uh, under at least uh, uh, two or maybe more condition, for example, fast surface water flow relative to infiltration. And this re actually relates to <coughs> phenomena that we, are, we know from other systems, like uh, phase separation, where there is conservation law that induce a uh, global constraint. Um, um, with regard to the question of universality, this, this is a topic that I'll address in, in my talk on, on Wednesday. But uh, on one hand, this is true. Well, uh, there is a, a high degree of universality, especially with instabilities. Um, on the other hand, if you, if you, if you, so, so you may ask, okay, I mean, any model that I'll take from the shelf that satisfies some, some minimal condition will give the same pattern. So what can we learn about the system? And this is why we need uh, a more detailed model, models that uh, capture basic feedbacks in the system. And uh, then those models uh, can uh, tell us what special features uh, uh, those patterns can have, which are non-universal. For example, you may have a biomass periodic biomass pattern. Associated with, the, with it, there is a periodic uh, soil water pattern but the soil water pattern can be in phase or out of phase with the biomass pattern. This will depend on this relative strength of the various feedbacks that act in the system. And, and this is a non-universal feature, and this may help understanding uh, observed phenomena. Okay, I'll stop here, I'll talk too much. I want uh, to say that I agree with uh, Ehud uh, to a large extent. Uh, that is, we have to look for uh, specific uh, mechanisms and specific, uh, here I am. <laughs> uh, and in, in reality, the, 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 because who is talking about models, right? All the time. But that's okay, of course. Uh, but if you uh, look in real systems, and I want to, uh, to refer to the work of, for example, uh, Vincent uh, de Blauwe, he has beautiful papers in which he showed the biogeographical uh, distribution of real patterns and they are quite bounded to specific regions right and that means that uh, uh, that should say something about uh, the mechanisms uh, underlying those patterns and of course uh, once we understand the, the general principles that uh, generate these patterns we can think about all kinds of mechanisms especially the smart ones under us uh, we can think about all kinds of mechanisms that reproduce the patterns but of course Indeed, they should be related to, to, to mechanisms occurring in the field and to the specific conditions that they, uh, they occur. And I think uh, if we look for um, uh, what the models predict in terms of uh, uh, the causal mechanism, but indeed also the overlapping patterns, you can always look for uh, specific uh, indications uh, what causes the patterns and where they do occur. And I think then we are uh, moving one step further. So, <coughs> to put some, uh, to add something which is very similar to what you have said on the other end. Uh, the first thing is that there is a big difference between uh, the patterns that we are seeing in uh, uh, ecosystems, the vegetation patterns, or the geomorphological patterns that were mentioned, uh, which are weakly nonlinear. And the, 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 the coherent structures, like the one that you showed, in the von Kalman street. Because in that case, the street itself comes from a linear instability, but the fact that uh, then the, 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 the little uh, eddies uh, organize themselves into coherent vortices, that is not an, a weakly nonlinear mechanism. So there's a big distinction between a solid and established uh, field, mathematical field of pattern formation as basically produced by the first instability uh, of a weekly, so in, the, in that sense, a weekly nonlinear system, um, maybe second instability if you think of uh, instability of the patterns themselves, but it's very close to the, to the equilibrium. And there are various methods to this, mathematical methods to describe them, 
and uh, coherent structures which are completely self-organized, like coherent vortices, convective plumes, and so on. We, and right now, there is no theory to describe why they emerge. We know a, a accepted theory. For example, for vortices, which are widespread, uh, it's absolutely not obvious uh, why, not how, but why the, flu the turbulent fluid organizes uh, itself into, into a, a long-lived coherent vortex. So this is the first thing. So given that the, the patterns are weakly nonlinear, they are close to the first instability. So they can be described by canonical equations. And these canonical equations are very similar. There are a few classes. And that's why all the patterns are similar, because they come from the, basically the same type of approximation of the governing equations, which are mysterious. So what the pattern can tell us is at most some information on the structure of the, of the linear problem, of the linear instability problem. So what wave number, it's a long wave number, it's a finite wave number, but it's the linear problem that the pattern is telling us about. Uh, and the saturation mechanism, possibly. Uh, then, then but, but not always. So this was the first thing. So that's why patterns do not bring so much information on the, on the uh, workings of the system itself uh, beyond the linear stage. The second point is that uh, uh, there is a big difference between uh, patterns uh, from physical systems, which is a very uh, ancient and well-established field, I mean, starting at least in the 40s and the 50s, um, and I would make the example of the convection patterns more than geomorphology, because also in geomorphology, I mean, the transport equations are, are semi-empirical somehow, while in convection you have Navier-Stokes, you do Businesk approximation at most, it's well controlled, it's well un understood, and you can compute what should come out from equations which you believe in, independent of the specific phenomenon you, you are trying to describe. And so you have predictions. So you have certain uh, uh, predictions on how the pattern should be. Should be a hexagon, should be a roll, should be a zigzag instability, and so on and so on. And then you can go to the laboratory and verify. And usually it has been verified. For the case of uh, uh, ecosystems, uh, as you said, all the models have been made up. Maybe they're right, maybe they're not. Maybe you use diffusion, maybe you use some integral current, maybe, but nobody knows what the equations are. And so you make up a model in order to reproduce what you observe, which is nice, but it doesn't go beyond that. I'd like to maybe add a slightly different frame of discussion to what we are talking about. Um, namely, maybe to ask ourselves what the pragmatic utility of what we're doing is. So we've seen some very different ways that people have discussed using patterns. Sonia is looking, for instance, at the utility as an indicator of proximity to threshold conditions, desertification states. We use this as a justification for our work a lot. I think Sonia's taken this really a very long way and that's been great. We've seen Moshi using some of the ideas that underlie the functioning of these systems as a template for restoration and that's another avenue. I think we've also had some talk and I think Emil Curry, you said this, that maybe we can use the emergence of these patterns to help us understand something about functioning of systems. But I guess I, I just wonder if we went to looking at these specific ultimate goals that we might have that give us the rationale for studying this field at all, maybe we could ask ourselves where, where are the opportunities for breakthroughs in terms of our ability to use this stuff in service of the world, which I think is what we all nominally pretend we're trying to do. So I'd like to throw that, that out there. I think that might be a fruitful area to discuss. Um. I would like uh, to show with you some uh, uh, experience that I have when we developed a movement ecology framework. So it was a large international group and uh, there were uh, some biologists and some physicists uh, involved and uh, my observation was that uh, there's really a big difference in the point of view, the scientific point of view between the, these two schools. In, in physics, uh, people are trained or educated to look for universal patterns and try to understand the, the basic principles that, that with, with such, uh, with very minimal uh, uh, approach, uh, how can you reproduce these uh, universal patterns? That's, uh, that's my observation 
Whereas in biology, uh, people are ed educated to, to appreciate the complexity of the system and try to uh, understand the details of the, of the systems. How species interact, how they interact with the environment, uh, between individuals, between uh, uh, population, between species, and, uh, and so on and so forth. This is more like what Moshe was, uh, the approach that Moshe was uh, presenting in the beginning. And uh, there's a, a quite big gap between uh, these two schools, and I think this, is, this conference is an opportunity to, to bridge this gap. And many of the people here are, are more pattern-oriented and more physics-educated. Uh, and uh, and uh, the same uh, uh, argument that Emil Carré put forward that uh, many different uh, mechanism can lead to, to the same pattern, we can look from the perspective of the mechanism and ask, okay, I have this mechanism, what kind of patterns I can accept from if, we, if I understand well the mechanism. So a particular set, for example, of movement modes and, and competition uh, uh, varieties can lead to many different patterns of, of the very same community. So uh, I, I think that we, can, we, we need to look at, at the both ways of, of approaching science and try uh, to develop some, some useful combination of, of, the, of these two. And here I'm, I think maybe that's my last uh, message is that I think what Sally said is that we need to think of what, what is going to be our major contribution to science after we do this, this marriage. And I think that um, it's beyond the pattern formation and beyond the understanding of the underlying mechanism. It's what, what, is the, what are the, the implications of, uh, of those patterns and mechanisms to higher level uh, uh, systems? H how ecosystem function? Uh, what are the, uh, how evolution, evolution works? Well, why uh, we have these traits in animals and why we have this set of of species in this place and not in the other, and these kind of big questions that also have applied context of, of major uh, uh, concerns are, I think, are the driving forces in the end of, of this uh, of this uh, marriage. Yeah. Yes, so I must say that I like the discussion. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I would like to. Uh, Respond to some of the comments here. Um, maybe first uh, to uh, Ran. I think uh, many of the models that have been produced started with the mechanisms. It's not that uh, there's a phenomenon and we try to, to choose a model that reproduces those phenomena. We worked out on the on the mechanism and just study what happens out or what what emerges from it. And luckily. Uh, uh, we, we did find uh, uh, patterns that uh, are similar to, to those we wanted to, uh, to obtain. Um, so, so, and I, I, I'm very familiar with the, this uh, 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 cultural differences between physicists and, uh, and ecologists, but there are also people in between on both sides. And so it's not uh, black, white, it's, uh, uh, there's also gray colors. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, I want to, co uh, to also to comment uh, uh, about uh, what uh, Antonello said. Antonello is, is very right in, in uh, uh, attributing many of the pattern formation to weak nonlinear phenomena arising from instabilities and the universal behavior to, to the fact that near such instabilities there are universal equations, normal form equations that uh, describe the dynamics. But pattern formation phenomena is not limited to the, non, uh, to the weakly nonlinear regime. In fact, most of the vegetation patterns that we see are far from uh, are highly nonlinear. And, uh, and, and then the validity of those uh, normal form equations is, is, is indeed uh, a question. I mean, uh, uh, I, mean they, they, uh, I mean, it should be examined. And, but pattern formation theory also provides us method to study systems that are far from, uh, uh, from, from uh, instabilities, and uh, um, uh, there are uh, various methods uh, to do that. 
So, um, um, uh, so it's also not only uh, uh, within non linear phenomena. And I wanted to, uh, one more uh, um, comment regarding, uh, um, actually two. Uh, one regarding the uh, comment here about uh, adding uh, external, and actually what, what uh, Amilcar uh, um, uh, said, uh, the effect of the physical template. So this is really a challenge, and uh, uh, a first step towards that uh, uh, has been made, uh, um, but this is mostly conceptual, but uh, in fact, if you have uh, a, a mosaics of, a, a, of a soil patches and rock patches, and which is uh, quite uh, often uh, quite uh, robust in the uh, arid regions, uh, you can actually, um, uh, and this is a work that has been done in with uh, Moshe Shachak and uh, with Efrat Shepher and Yost and Chesi Yitzchak, uh, you can uh, take into account the effects of the rocks as sources for runoff uh, for the vegetation that may be develop in the adjacent uh, soil uh, patches. And, and actually there is a nice effect of that is that you can obtain in the same uh, uh, system, the same environmental condition, conditions, all vegetation states that, uh, uh, that usually you observe only along, along the rainfall gradient. And uh, one, uh, uh, more remark uh, about the, I, I, I perfectly, perfectly agree with you that uh, it's not pattern formation that is the goal, uh, it's just uh, an intermediate step. So pattern formation actually already tells us uh, uh, that we should take it, it in, into account in study, uh, for example, regime shifts, which is a, a, a functional aspect. Um, but I think uh, pattern formation is, is very important also for the studies of biodiversity. Ecologists uh, uh, recognized long ago the, the importance of heterogeneity in the system on biodiversity, but they, uh, they always assume this heterogeneity is fixed, it's given, and then study the implication on, on, on uh, biodiversity. But that heterogeneity can be self-organized and uh, how uh, that self-organized heterogeneity affects biodiversity is a question that uh, can, I mean, we have now the tools to start studying the hard problem, but, and uh, it has to be studied, and possibly also the feedback of, of, uh, the, uh, of, the, of the species organization on, on, on pattern formation. I think that is for this side. Yeah. Um, this is kind of confessions of a pattern seeker. Uh, I, I studied fingered flow. Uh, this is the 40th anniversary of kind of the major understanding, and Eve, of course, uh, led a lot of this. So fingered flow in soils. Now, there's a lot to learn from this example. It's a lovely pattern. It has, shows different scaling relationships, different function of texture, all that stuff. But maybe what you don't understand or you haven't seen because you're not in the thick of it is that, um, you know, it really depends on very few things, right? You have sand. You have liquid. You have a surface tension, right? This is all quite simple. Now, it turns out that um, I just accepted yet another paper that said we finally put the nail in the coffin on fingered flow and the dimensions of it, and it's trying yet again. The point is that uh, we ran these experiments. We thought we knew what was going on. Then some 20 some odd years later, 25 years later, we ran some more experiments, and it didn't work at all, okay? It turns out if you used water, everything was fine, but the scaling equation simply didn't work when you used different liquids, and all of a sudden, it became clear that the Richards equation really wasn't unstable in this, in the, in the, if, if it was interpreted classically and you had to look at the wetting fronts. And we're now back in the debate, 40 years later, a simple system. Now, let's just take a look by comparison at the system we're looking at today. There's basic length scales with roots, surface redistribution, shade scale, animal path scale, insect travel length scales, diffusion length scales, soil capillary length scales, seed travel length scales, atmospheric turbulence on the land surface length scales, and heterogeneity of soils. Now, I mean, I guess it's just, you know, if you come from the simple system I came from, and we're 40 years into it, and we're just now thinking that some of us, you know, we kind of have our hands around it, okay? So I think you have to be extremely humble 
that when you're looking at these extraordinarily complex systems with lots of nonlinearities and some of them strong nonlinearities, and coming in and thinking that you have the mechanism when a toy model works. Uh, we thought we had the right mechanism. We are, it turns out Eve was not far off. There's no, there's no question about that. There was some truth in it, but there was a lot more to it. So I, I am very troubled uh, by the lack of humility that I hear in terms of, of you know, I, I, I guess I have, I, I have, you know, I have sinned and, and I have learned that, uh, that one should be humble in these matters because it's much more complicated than you think. But also, I guess I'm a little bit troubled by the lack of experiments. I think that we have to go out and buy some alfalfa seeds and throw them, around the, throw them around in a pot of sand and see what the heck happens. And we have to do some simple experiments that we can predict. And uh, maybe I'm just missing that this has all happened. But um, personally, I, I guess I would like, I, I think I'd put in a word for, of caution in assuming that we understand as much as we, as, as perhaps some in the room believe we do. I mean, Good comment. Uh, yes, Gabby. Just to put a little bit on John's uh, comment. In fact, uh, some of the patterns that were published as carbon-water interactions patterns, uh, Von Hattenberg had one used <coughs> as a paper in PRL that showed actually uh, a labor net pattern in grass in grasslands, which could have easily been reinterpreted as a convection pattern, has nothing to do with carbon-water. Um, actually, Sally had a paper on that topic, in, which actually showed that a convection model because of chilling of the grass in the first frost produced exactly the same pattern that you could have easily produced from a carbon water interaction. So, <laughs> so that's a convection pattern. It had nothing to do with carbon or water, but it had the same wavelengths and the same properties that you would have seen from a model that would have generated carbon water. And in fact, <laughs> interesting enough, after Sally published this paper with Karen Daniels, uh, there was an artificial experiment done in a golf course, not intended, but the part of the golf course was cut and the other part was not cut. And it turned out to be that the part that was cut did not exhibit this pattern and the part that was not cut exhibited exactly that pattern. Well, and, and just to, to expand on that a little bit, I, I got into biology at one point where we actually injected microbes into our sand packs. So this is a perfect uniform sand. We inject some microbes and we all <laughs> think we know what's going to happen when this biosurfactants and blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, it's totally different. And we published the five or seven papers on that. And, you know, the thing is, you turn to the biologist and say, what the hell's happening here? And so, oh, didn't I tell you there was that other pathway that could be switched on if the conditions were anaerobic and so the, the, bi the microbes can become non-modal and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, I had exactly one stinking bacteria in this column and, and it completely went in opposite direction that everyone who thought they knew what they were talking about was predicted. So I guess, again, from a humility point of view, and, and I'm, I'm sure there are brighter people than me about all these things, but... It's, it was scary how with one microbe and one grain size monodispersed sand, we couldn't predict. So I just, again, I, I just a little bit get it like, oh, it's scary. Good morning. I would like to suggest uh, some a little bit uh, another view on patterns. Uh, I'm not ecologist, uh, but I'm a hydrologist and working a lot with uh, patterns. In some cases, not always, um, it's the word pattern is a bit vague. And, uh, we, to learn from pattern is a little bit hard. And in some cases, it would be very helpful to look on the dominant elements the, uh, in terms of the process we want to study. And uh, just uh, to give an example, maybe from geomorphology, uh, we can take DTM and look for patterns, but sometimes it will be very much more beneficial, uh, beneficial to look on hill slopes and channels, which are maybe the dominant elements for the process we want to study. So I think in some cases uh, we, we need to look on elements and the elements is the structure or is the main, uh, uh, is the, is the main, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, um, it's, it's more, it's better represents the processes we want to learn. So it's an idea to look also on elements to represent uh, our, our uh, system. After these uh, <coughs> public uh, psychoanalytic uh, 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 moment or, or, or coming out, then we should uh, perhaps at this point start discussing, so what do we do? Where do we go? I mean, uh, how can we use the amount of uh, uh, knowledge that has been developed, which should be taken with uh, a lot of 
grains of salt, but uh, um, in order to get something useful on, on a different uh, scale, I mean, not only for the beauty of the patterns, which is okay, but uh, I mean, for, for understanding ecosystems uh, or modeling them or getting some prediction or something. Yes, Gordon. <coughs> Um, with, with hopefully with some degree of humility in deference to my colleague, uh, Dr. Selker, um, I wonder if it would be helpful to think about uh, hierarchies of control with respect to patterns and pattern formation. Um, and what I'm thinking about here is how there, there seem to be, the, pe people are all using the word pattern, but I'm not sure we all have the same thing in our heads. And so I, I picture pattern formation as sort of responding to certain sort of hierarchies where you have some patterns that are clearly the result, and I'm speaking of patterns in vegetation as, as the, the, the theme, patterns that are clearly organized by the flow of energy through a system, uh, whether that's gravitationally driven flows, you know, trees along a stream, uh, 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 features that may or can organize themselves either uh, parallel or orthogonal to gravitational fluxes. But there's other kinds of energy through a system too. A, a fire running through a landscape organizes the pattern uh, just by that energetics. There, there are thermal gradients, and we heard some of that yesterday. Um, so I, I, I think there's some patterns that are well understood or at least recognized in terms of their causal mechanisms. I suspect that some of what we're thinking about here might fall more under the heading of cryptic patterns or, or where the mechanisms are cryptic, where there is a, clearly some evidence of a pattern of some coherent structure, but it's less clear what the mechanism is. And there is where that's the realm of where we need some kinds of both metrics that first establish that there really is a pattern, and second, that we begin to develop a kind of set of controls that could include things like uh, chemical gradients, um, uh, limiting gradients that just come from things like we heard about yesterday in terms of you know, utilization of water, things like that. So I think it would be useful in some just to organize our thinking along some sort of hierarchy uh, of, of these controlling mechanisms. Sorry, just to... Uh, Maybe we have uh, 25 more minutes. Let's, we, we need to try to get to uh, here, yes. Um, kind of, I, I'm wondering if maybe in terms of what do we do next, right? We can combine what I think is a great recommendation from John that there has to be experiments to test these things. But also Sally's point, we, we have to address why we care. And these things, you know, this is eco-hydrology, and a lot of these patterns, we think, are driven by gradients in water availability. And we actually really care if these patterns change the way water is used, right? The partitioning between water and streams and the atmosphere. And I think there's ways to think about experiments and that both test the processes that go into the formation of the pattern. And what we really actually care about if those are, if those are processes that we think are gonna change, right? That if climate's gonna change, then it will change the pattern, right? So those are the things that we should focus on first, right? The places where we think temperature and precipitation, magnitude and variability are the things that control the pattern. And test those first, because those are the things that matter. And if then those patterns change the amount of water and carbon, you know, if we move towards a maximum entropy or a maximum use of some resource because of these patterns, then that really matters to society because that really changes how landscapes use resources that we care about. So I think there's a way of moving forward and designing strategic experiments around, based on the things we care about most, which because it's semi-arid and it's eco-hydrology is, is water. I would like to add uh, another point looking at a uh, vegetation pattern. I will not talk about every pattern, 
from my point of view, vegetation pattern is a process of biotic landscape modulation. That's what's happened. You have an area with no pattern, let's say a bare area, and after a while there is bended vegetation. So now, if you are changing the landscape, there are many fields in which we can integrate the eco-hydrology with field in ecology. For example, patch dynamics. What is pattern formation is basically patch dynamics, creating patches within the landscape in uh, one pattern or another. And then you can ask what will be the effect on ecosystem processes? What will be the effect on competition? What will be the effect on facilitation? And all of them, of course, will result in biodiversity at the end. But basically, we have to look from ecological point of view on pattern formation as landscape modulation process. And we can ask what is happening naturally. And of course, if humans and humans, we as humans, we are changing the pattern everywhere. And so, so my suggestion is to, e in the future, to integrate better eco-hydrology with landscape ecology, with patch dynamic, and with this way we can pro progress toward many questions that uh, people are asking uh, nowadays about what is the effect of humans as ecosystem engineers on uh, the landscape and how this affects biodiversity, productivity, and human well-being. So that's, I think, the main point, the feedback from the pattern formation to ecology. that you see are generally not very difficult to explain or have been explained in terms of convection process. You know, there are some, the goal of science in there, I disagree a little bit. I mean, the goal of science is to put the goal, I mean, is, 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 you know, the, those are convection patterns, okay, to bring unity to immense, uh, immense variety of things. That's a fundamental role of science. Uh, I don't want to go back to the times of, you know, I am, I am very, very appreciative of rainfall and of modeling. We all have used it. And uh, for engineering practice, it's, it's, it's a wonderful tool and so on. And sometimes I wonder in open discussion with my students is how much it has contributed really to our understanding of basic things in hydrology. You know, is, every time we model a river basin, and I have modeled many of them in many parts of the world in consulting type of things, you know, how much do I learn that brings unity into the infinite variety of ways a, a, a river basin response. And that is the goal of science. Now, the detection of the pattern is for me a very important thing. Now, when I see a spot, the, 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 you know, how did Leopard got spots, okay? And, and uh, the, that, that uh, you were mentioning, Danny, of course, the pattern is obvious there. And the pattern has been explained mechanistically, okay? And uh, it's, you know, mutat is mutante. Of course, there are differences with the tiger bush. But there are many similarities to the same thing that with the convection thing. There are activation inhibition things, there are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are things to be explained, like those diffusion coefficients that I keep reminding people. Sorry, I have to mention those, those. You know that in some models, to explain the tiger bush, you need either to appeal to a lot of overland flow or to appeal to lateral. You have a diffusion term with a completely realistic diffusion, uh, diffusion constant. Now, uh, I don't want to get into that. The thing is, those patterns are obvious to the eye. I think many times the most interesting ones are not obvious to the eyes. 
are the ones that you find or imagine that they can exist. Fingering is obvious to the eye. But there are patterns that exist that are not obvious to the eye. And you find them with either, in first thing, with imagination, and second thing, thinking a lot about them. If they, are, they are not, I mean, you look at the river basin, and, and you say, you tell a student, find a pattern. And the first thing that, uh, let's talk at the, at, at the large scale. The first thing that the student probably will say is, well, there is a network of channels and has one root, and there are no loops. Well, that's a lot. Huh? Why there are no loops? And then you say, well, there is another network also, which is coupled to also to a very interesting ecological thing, which is not added, it's deltas. But they have a lot of loops. Why do they have a lot of loops? And before starting to explain, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the intricacies of the, the width of the loop versus the length of the loops and the number of this and the number of that is, let's try to answer some questions. You know, if I were analyzing the river basin, about that. Those questions, many of them have not been answered. The one of the upper river network without loops has been answered by hydrologists, but not the other one. Wait, John, you could say, well, it flows on both sides. Well, yeah, yeah, that's a very superficial answer, right? Are there any types of quantitative descriptions, I'm taking this just as an example, of the roots, of the patterns of roots in a plant? Are any type of descriptions of the patterns on a delta, which by the way probably are very similar in a delta and in a, in a root system. If we are going to describe, if we are going to study the functioning of roots, probably something will be useful to have in terms of the description of this pattern. Now, after we have detected the pattern, and say, okay, there is a pattern there that by the way, to detect the pattern is very challenging sometimes because one thing is to say, oh, look at that mess. You know, there are loops over the place and so on and so on. But the pattern establishes relation among the parts of the whole. That for me is a pattern. And I believe there is a pattern both in the river network and in the roots. And there is a pattern which may be random. The randomness has a pattern. It's a random pattern. The vegetation in the river basin is not organized as a tiger bush, but has patterns into it. How does, you know, how nature responds to, you know, not to average rainfall. Nobody believes the average rainfall is going to control by such many of the patterns. It's the dynamics of the rainfall, of the precipitation process, both the snow and the rain in the vegetation of an ecosystem or river basin. And now, if, if you look at it, okay, and, and, and we're not looking at things like Tiger Bush or different type of things, we're looking at, 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 at things that are not that obvious, which I think are the most important ones, because are the most common ones, are the ones that you get into a watershed and you say, where is the pattern here, please? To try to devise ways, to especially try to teach our students to, to, to think about the problem, at least to think of, how do I go about finding a possible pattern here? And uh, what are the methodologies to try to find that? And then if I find the pattern or I'm looking for it already, that's a big thing. Then comes the second step. Okay, is there is a mechanistic process behind the explaining the pattern? Maybe, you know, two differential equations, couple of these or three or whatever, you know? Or maybe a more cellular automata type of thing, a la pair back, which by the way, didn't like his, always maintain, was quite a physicist, they always maintain that why to go to newer stocks and so on and so on, if you could do the same type of thing with other things. I'm not going to get size on that, but I don't believe that you need to go, you know, one way or another. But a, me a mechanistic explanation of how the pattern is taking place is not the same thing at all of explaining why the pattern which is the thing where the gold medal at the end of the day is. Why the pattern? Why nature is having that pattern? That's a third question. Finding the pattern, the mechanism, the mechanism behind the pattern, and then asking, why the pattern? Why does it exist the pattern? And if we integrate those three things, then we are really making progress in the search for patterns in a fundamental way. That is more or less what I'm thinking on that. <laughs>
15 more minutes, slightly less. One thing is, uh, probably uh, the title of, of our entire session is misleading because we started from the word pattern, but what we're actually all interested in, and this seems, seems clear from the discussion, is actually the processes and the feedbacks, uh, which occur in, uh, well, in, in water-limited, but in general, I would say, in resource-limited uh, systems. And uh, so, of course, our focus needs to be on, on, the, on, on, on these. Um, then there is a point that uh, we have talked about the mathematical modeling uh, issue. Um, you know, it, it, we should go beyond the mere uh, rep reproduction, of course, of the patterns themselves. What these models are very useful for is actually in waiting for actual control experiments, as I would, was saying. You can start doing experiments with models. You can uh, switch on, switch off some of these mechanisms and uh, look at the dynamics look at the trend and, and look uh, actually at what happens to the system and they start screening out the importance, the role of the different um, mechanisms, which you yourself put in the model, but these come from your understanding of the functioning of the system. And then you can start uh, attributing weights to these different um, processes and, dif and feedbacks. Um, and it, and, and uh, also often um, the simple effort of reproducing uh, patterns or what you observe in some systems allows you to discover mechanisms which you may not have thought of at the beginning. Uh, if I think of these uh, irregular patterns or, well, scale-free or not, uh, of the wide, dis wide or heavy tail distributions of, uh, which we have seen already yesterday, um, what, what seems clear there is that uh, these are all systems where you have a clear relationship between, uh, usually between the precipitation level and the fraction of error cover. So that's the main thing which links all the observation. And then the vegetation organizes itself um, to, to respect that, and at the same time presents a wide distribution of patch size. Well, this immediately leads to the, to the idea that you need a global constraint. And if you test your models, you begin, uh, if you try to build a deterministic model of that, uh, you, you immediately see that uh, the existence of global constraint is needed. And so then you start thinking of what are the physical realizations of this, uh, of this constraint. So you, then you start thinking of uh, water flow on the surface, water flow in the ground, and so on. And then the other point uh, I wanted to address is, um, uh, I think I believe we should use our last minutes actually to discuss this, is really where should we go from here? Um, we, uh, we have, uh, we have heard many examples of how uh, of, of processes and uh, issues which have which we have neglected up to now. Uh, one is uh, the whole complexity of the systems. So looking at biodiversity or the complexity of the ecosystems in general. So introducing more uh, um, processes. And and the other is actually the relationship between these systems we are studying and uh, um, other scales. So, for example, the interaction between uh, um, the, 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 the role which these patterns or these uh, this forms of organization of vegetation may play on such larger scales. We have to look at the variable transformation fluxes and see if they may have a role, for example, uh, for climate at the regional or larger scales. And, and then we start thinking how should we use this information, how should we translate it to these larger scales. These are just some, some examples, and I believe we should discuss this. Uh, how, how, where should we go from here to now? Um, so to, uh, to address where to go next, um, I guess one of, the, one of the very challenging things, at least when you think about uh, indicators of degradation, is uh, confronting the model predictions to data especially aerial images. And I think as, as soon as we start doing that, we, we find that there are lots of ch challenges, uh, finding the right data, finding gradients, uh, analyzing the images, the statistical ways of analyzing the images and so on. And um, there are actually very few people that have been doing that. Um, I know the team of René Lefebvre and uh, Vincent de Blau and Nicolas Barbier 
uh, have done that uh, to some extent and you've done a great job, but um, actually these data are freely available for almost the whole planet, I believe. And so there's quite, quite a lot to do in that direction, I think, so testing what's happening on different types of soils with different types of vegetation and confronting what the models predict to what is actually observed in the field. And the, the second thing, so testing the models, confronting the models to, to data is one thing. And the second thing um, that was mentioned is we need more experiments. And um, unfortunately, I guess for a lot of these systems, the time scales are so long that doing actual risk, like experiments in the field is, is quite challenging. Um, but we have a number of experiments that are done regularly with restoration projects. So they are restoration projects in many areas around the world and, and they use all of these ideas, the, the, the knowledge we have and the feedback and so on. So we could, we could use these restoration um, uh, projects to, to try to also see how they, how they compare to our models and how they help us understanding what are the dominant mechanisms. Because I, would like, I would like to, uh, uh, to strengthen the, uh, the need in, in controlled experiments. I mean, when you experiments in pattern formation are designed to be very well controlled because you need to not to start this transit. You want to do to reach the asymptotic state of the system. For that purpose, you need to wait long enough, which means the, that the, the experiment should be very much uh, controlled. Uh, and this is the uh, hard part with, with the ecological system because of the time scale and length scale. But there are certain species, and this is uh, one of the challenges, uh, uh, to identify those species that uh, uh, allow to scale down the problem to, uh, to manageable uh, time scale and length scale. Uh, one candidate for that are a general class of candidate, is the grass. Species like like uh, poor vibusa, uh, that forms uh, uh, or, or uh, Aspalum vaginatum type, type of grass that uh, uh, pattern have been observed with this uh, type of uh, species on the scale of 10, 10 uh, centimeters, like uh, typical leg scale, which means that on a system of one meter large, you have or you can already check uh, pattern formation uh, aspects. And, uh, um, uh, and that gross time scale is, is uh, not that long. It can be a matter of uh, weeks or, or, or months. And so uh, there is a starting point here, and there should be the initiative to do it. Thank you. Um, so I think we are in the last few minutes left. Yes. I wanted to, um, to comment on a couple of things. So I, when this idea of where to go next, I think uh, uh, some of the important points have been made now on uh, the how, the experiments, etc. I think there have been also some interesting points uh, uh, during this discussion. Well, some points were about what, what is a pattern? And uh, we heard about cryptic patterns uh, and about uh, uh, what we really mean uh, uh, what we are really looking for. And the other thing is uh, why. So uh, I think those are very, very interesting points that were made uh, during this discussion. Sally was talking about uh, uh, why should we care about patterns. Uh, and of course we know that they, they could, um, and she, she, she alluded uh, to a, a few points. Uh, for example, they might tell us something on the proximity to a threshold. I think we are very far from that. So we, uh, we from, uh, understanding if they can use, uh, use in this way, or can tell us something about the function of the system or the underlying organization, etc. So, w but Ignacio had uh, also an interesting uh, question, this was his last question, why the, uh, the, uh, why the patterns is even more important, he said, uh, than uh, their mechanistic uh, explanation. Why uh, does uh, nature work in a way that uh, leads to the emergence uh, of uh, some, uh, some patterns? And uh, then uh, I'm um, personally also, in when we look at uh, where to go next, uh, I'm uh, personally very interested in uh, the role of noise in the formation of patterns. And that's uh, uh, something that uh, is difficult to, uh, 
will, it will always be difficult to find uh, uh, the experiment or the method to, to, um, to uh, assess the, whether these mechanisms of uh, noise-induced pattern formation can uh, um, really uh, be uh, tested in a proper way, but still I think the, the uh, question behind that is a, a deep one and uh, an important one. The um, um, idea of what is a pattern, uh, years ago again when we met, uh, uh, some of us um, met uh, uh, for a similar meeting in Val Severance in Italy and uh, um, Sai uh, Levin came with this, uh, um, I like this, uh, his uh, uh, definition of patterns which I think uh, uh, was stated somewhere else but I'm citing him, the patterns are the, in the eyes of the beholder. And uh, now from Ignacio we hear another thing, that the patterns may be not even visible to uh, people. And uh, with this I think he's referring to some work that has been done in geomorphology uh, where um, there are some patterns of uh, incredible universality and regularity that would not be apparent by just by looking at uh, a, a topographic map, but they do uh, exist and they tell us a lot about uh, how the system works. Perhaps uh, in ecology it's time to start looking also for this type uh, of uh, uh, patterns. And uh, then I'm taking too much time, so I need to let uh, Amiri go. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm just going to conclude thanking everyone for, I think, what, what has been a very nice discussion. I think this is uh, an open discussion. We have uh, one and a half days more to, to keep discussing this. We have several other roundtables in which I think many of these concepts will, uh, will appear again. I just want to underlie two things that I, I think we should keep in mind. One is the, the need to bridge between the community. I think Ran made that point very clear. Uh, and, and for this, I really would, th there are people who come more from the physics, mathematics background, uh, other more from the hydrology or biology or, or ecology. I think it's necessary that these communities sit together, and we are already doing this, and come up with uh, even simple things like lists of processes so that uh, everyone understands. There is uh, an example in the book of Sornet, for example, about power laws. Uh, there is a, this book is on critical phenomena in the natural sciences, where basically there is a chapter which I find very instructive, although simple, which basically is a list of processes that give power laws. And it, it puts them in, in comparison, and I think this is an exercise, as simple as it may be, that we could do. And it would be very beneficial for, it may be obvious for some part of the community, but it may not be for others. And it would bring us to the same, uh, uh, on the same page. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that uh, clearly came out was the need of confronting with experiments. It's almost like the motto of this workshop, and I think it, it, it's extremely important that we think of controlled experiments data. There will be future uh, uh, sections on that, so let's keep that in mind. And the broad view of patterns is not just necessarily the pattern formation type of pattern, but also the noise, the, the role of heterogeneity, the, the template that may be imposed by hydrology. So all of those things are clear material for us to think more on, on those topics. Thank you very much, everyone.